tonight. We're going to clap on three. One, two, three. What's up, everybody? Welcome to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're so glad that you're here. As always, I am your host, Lauren Ash. And as always, I am joined by my co hostess with the most S, Christy Oxborough. How are you feeling? Doing great. Fantastic. Love to have. Love to see that for you. That is a um, daily statement in my life. Always. Daily. I say it to people that I don't think even listen to the show and they don't get it. And I kind of sing it sometimes and they look at me like I'm I'm uh, a kook. Um, yeah. And to that I say, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, welcome to my life. The amount yeah. of times I say things uh, to my kids and my cats um, that I know they obviously don't listen to the show. Sure. Uh, but I make references to it a lot. Because I think I'm quite funny sometimes. <laughs> um, and I say a lot of things to them expecting some sort of response. Yeah. I don't tend to get one. Now, I know that you can police what the children listen to, but I don't know that you can police the cats. You never know. You never know what's on their... Oh, my God. Their little radios, you know? I have just thought, uh, while I was while we were away, we, we discussed it briefly last week, uh... Obviously couldn't take the cats with us. Um, so they stayed with a boarder. Yes. How did I not request that our podcast play daily? Oh, that would make sense. For them to hear my voice all the time. And I and sound like yours, you. And then just think it's me nonstop talking to myself. That's how they live. Listen, here's my question. How are yeah. they doing now that they've been back home for a minute? Because I, I don't think they weren't necessarily adjusting uh well, yeah they were there for a bit of time and ended up having to be there um a day extra uh because our flight got canceled but got them home uh well as it is to be there cheddar um took a couple of days sure and was like i don't know about these people this is weird and then all of a sudden it was like these people are my best friends i love it love it evie was like this is the worst. I will murder you all. They took photos of the of of the cats and they took them of like all the pets that were in their care. And they would post them every day. It was the first time I've seen Evie hiss. Uh, she was pissed. She was mad. She hated the whole experience. She wouldn't come out for us to be able to take her home. Like the, the worker, bless her heart, tried to like get her out. She wouldn't come out. My husband had to like go in and like retrieve her. I was like, it's going to be great. She's going to be so happy when she's home. Um, to say, uh, to describe Evie in a single word now. Sure. Cold. <laughs> <laughs> she well, she wouldn't put me out if I was on fire. She's, she'll come around. She'll Maybe. come around. It's been a couple of weeks. Uh, she says, uh, she, Yeah. Her her cry also she still does a very high pitched meow, um has turned somehow whiny, so it oh. used to be this cute little like, but now it's like it's pained. Uh, she's perfectly fine. She's you know doing her own thing, but doesn't want to go near you. Doesn't want to. Sure. Isn't interested. Isn't interested. Uh, Cheddar won't leave you alone. Mm -hmm. She Cheddar would often like sit near me if I was working or whatever. Now she has to be, has to be touching me. So it has, seems has to be it's... on my lap, has to be near my face. She's more chatty than she's ever been. You say something to her and she'll chat back at you. And so it's like exactly so what, I... what I wanted to happen to Evie. Sure. What I'm Jenna. hearing here is that they've both gone through a trauma. They have. Yes. And they're both uh, reacting in yeah. different um, attachment styles. This is a psychologist yeah. hat moment brought to you by Lauren Ash and ah. therapy. Uh, it seems course. that Evie mm -hmm. is going through an avoidant. She's she's the way that she's mm -hmm. chosen to cope is avoidance. And then and then Cheddar sure. is anxious. Cheddar is I've got to hang on to yeah. you. I need to be close to you. Um, well, we brought we brought stuff from home because we, we were like, we want something they're familiar with. We want something that they know the scent of. We want whatever. Sure. So we took one of their favorite things that we have as a cat tree. So we unscrewed the beds from the cat tree so that they could go in this place they were sleeping. They slept in them all the time. 
we also brought this cardboard scratcher because they kind of scratch it, but it's more one of Cheddar's favorite places to lay. She anxious ate around the <laughs> outside of it. We have never seen her do that before. She eats like everything, like paper that she can find, but she has never bitten this thing ever mm-hmm. since she's been home. If she lays on it, just like she will full start gnawing on it. So I do think she's anxious. We have two cat diffusers, stress diffusers in my home at all times. They're on a stress food. Like I, They get love whenever they ask. So I, I will... I don't push Evie. I will, if I go near her, I always put a hand out to get her consent uh, before I'm allowed to move closer. 99% of the time, I am not allowed. Uh, And that's fine. I respect it. And I walk away. Uh, And I, I will, I do a lot less work because I can't type with a cat in my face. Uh, But that's just apparently what Cheddar needs right now. And I accept it. Yeah. They are... They are changed. They are slightly different. I'm going to be honest with you. When I had uh, my old cat, Aiden, may he rest, I adopted Sharky uh, as a playmate for him. And it took a year. It took a full calendar year. For a year, Aiden wouldn't let me pet him. If I tried to pet him like I always did, he would move his back. So like it's like I couldn't make uh, like my hand. Yeah, it took a year. And then finally, after a year, he was like, all right, I accept that this other cat is staying and I'll go back to the way I was. So I I saved this to tell you because I didn't want to tell you maybe it would take a lot of time. I hoped that by now they would have come around. Um, yep. Cheddar sounds like, again, that's a, a more functional uh, way to live. Yes. She, just, she wants to be loved. She was reminded um, people would go in and visit with them and pet them and all that every day. Evie didn't want to be touched. Cheddar <laughs> learned. This is how I'm getting my people time. Yep. And now Cheddar is like, I went so long without you. So at night, it's just the two of them. And they were used to that. Right. When it, when Before we left. And now when I let them upstairs in the morning, it's, oh my God, for the love of God, never leave me again. Like Cheddar is like, I can't believe I had to go that long without human touch. Please, please just hold me. And that, dear listeners is also my attachment style. <laughs> I want you to know yeah. that as we were talking about this, because my brain works too quickly and it works like yeah. a movie sometimes, what I could picture was me with a pair of little glasses and a pipe and an ascot in a in a like a very thick wool cardigan. Yeah. Um, and then just each one of the cats laid on their back on my couch as I was like an old school, like Freud type being like, tell me about your time. Tell me about your time in the cage. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Not that it was yeah. a cage. It wasn't a full cage, but you know what I'm saying. No. Oh, yeah, I get it. I will feel guilty about it till the end of time. I didn't have options uh, for what to do uh, so that they would have somebody always coming in and feeding them and giving them attention and that sort of thing. And the place was lovely. And I think overall they would have had a good time. But yeah, they're pandemic cats. We got them when they were just tiny, tiny babies. And they basically lived in this house with exception to the drive to the vet. And that's it. So they only know us and the like, the few people that come around. And Evie still hasn't come around to my kids yet. <laughs> so that says a lot about who she is. Um, Like, she was a baby. That's all she probably remembers is that these children right. exist. But she's just like, mm, not interested. But she's always been a bit moody um on a brighter note uh something about that that trip i forgot to tell you last time uh we talked about it i want to say months ago where you said that (laughs) for you i needed to go to 7-eleven enough that they would notice (laughs) that i went you were gone yeah i was gone for a week uh, I went in there after I got home. I was pretty anxious to get in there because I was excited to have what I was used to and what I remember and all of this. Uh, get my drink. They say hello as soon as I walk in. Nothing new. Great. Get my drink. Go Come to the till and I get a, where the heck you been? They noticed. They absolutely noticed. 
well, that's a relief for me. And I was like, this actually checks out. Yep. And I'm like, of anybody who knew I was gone, it was the staff at 7-Eleven. That makes sense. But hey, that means I'm doing what I was asked. And I appreciate that. I'm going there now so often. I need to find something like that. Yes. Uh, I'm now going there so often that it used to be where I would say to my husband, like, oh, you know, I'm thinking Slurpees today. And he would be like, oh, yeah, great. And if I said it the next day, he'd be like, really? We just went yesterday. Whereas now he's to a point of, so are you getting your Slurpee now or later today? <laughs> yeah. Look, I respect that. And again, yeah. I-, I think I need to employ something like that in my daily life. Yeah. So that then if I go missing, you have someone to call other than the dogs. I mean, you could try calling Sharky. He's just not, I don't know that he's as reliable. You he's know, He's going to push the phone off the counter. He's not going to yep. listen. Yeah. Now, listen, I have an update that I don't even think I've told. I don't think I've even told you this. Oh, I can't wait. And it kind of connects to a past case. Hey. Yeah. So I was offered a ticket to an event coming up in Los Angeles, California. Yeah. Something called Wrestlemania. Oh, shit. And I said, hell yes. Love to go. Would love to go. So what have I been doing for the past couple days? Well. If I have a uh, time I want to put on a program, I have been watching these A&E specials. They've got a bunch of different new ones where it's like, you know, profiles of certain wrestlers. But then also they have um, like famous feuds and stuff like that. Oh, I watched the Trish Stratus Lita feud episode, which was fantastic. Shout out to both of them because they really yeah. were renegades. And then today I thought, oh, they just did a new China episode. Now, if you're a newish listener to the show, you may not have gone through our entire catalog, but I did an episode of the show about pro wrestler China, yeah. and that episode changed me. Of course. It changed who I am. I It's my trauma like Evie and Cheddar went through. It, it was the yes. Gacy episode changed me. Yes. The Amy Winehouse episode changed me, and the China yes. episode changed me, and- but 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 China's probably up there as the number one. I came out of that like, like truly, it it was a very intense experience for me, which I know sounds wild, but it's just the truth. Anyway, so I watched this documentary today, screaming at the TV for parts of it, screaming. Okay, there was one guy who had written some sort of biography about her, and he's like, she was offered a good deal to stay at the WWE, and literally me from in the kitchen, bullshit. Mm-hmm. Which, by the way, is true. I'm right. I know I'm right. I've done the research. Anyway, but I think he worked for the company, so. Of then they really glossed over the Triple H, Stephanie McMahon thing, because all these documentaries have been produced by the WWE, and I was like, hold uh, on a second here. Really gro- glossed over that. Yeah. But then that filmmaker who made the documentary, which was the main one that I was focusing right. on, in my uh, episode. And I can't remember his name. And to be honest with you, I'm glad I can't. He doesn't deserve my memory. Oh, boy. You know the one I'm talking about. Yeah. He made a comment and I bubbled up and literally uh, earnest, completely earnest, out of my body, out of my mouth came, stop talking about my friend like that. I really know that many people may say, you've gone off the deep end, Lauren Ash. But I no. think I just felt so close to her in my research for that episode. And I felt like I was like, if if I had been in her life, if you and I had been in her life, she just needed a good friend. She didn't even have one good friend or family member who was like really looking out for her at the end, you know? Right. And I just got so mad. And there was a scene where he, that gentleman who again mm-hmm. if you, i'm not going to repeat myself for those who have listened but if you haven't listened i highly recommend that episode of the show you can hear me get real wild real passionate real emotional um but that guy who planned the terrible memorial service if you remember and yep. charged people to go charged yep. people to take photos with her urn of ashes disgusting yep um i'd say it to his face no problem anyway there's footage of him spreading her ashes in the ocean but he took a camera crew and was like, do you need me to, do you need me to move differently for the slow motion? And I was just like, 
it just made my blood boil in a way that it took me back to my time with that episode. And so I just want to say, first of all, could not be more excited to go to WrestleMania. I haven't followed wrestling in a real way for many, many years. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's going to be a hoot and a whole lot of fun. And then secondly, shout out to China. Because you know what? Even as more documentaries are being made that are not telling the full accurate truth, that are turning things in ways that they shouldn't be, um, there are some of us that really did care. And we really do care about yeah. your legacy. And if you can hear me, and I believe on some energetic level, perhaps that's possible. Uh, I just want to put that out there. That some of us do have her best intentions in mind. And I sure. apologize that we couldn't have been there for you when you needed it. Uh, two things. Yeah. One. I say this in earnest. Please. What will it take to get you to do your own China talk? I'm pretty darn close. You, the, you, you know what the problem is, is, is getting the licensing for the footage. Of course. That's part of the problem. Um, <clears throat> but maybe it's easier than I think. No, I know. I'm so fired up about it. I really am. Yeah. I, I, it makes my blood boil. And I think it's also because she was a woman that like beat the odds in a male do dominated industry and then just yeah. got treated like trash. Yeah. And they didn't tell, uh, look, come for me. I don't care. I don't think they told the story properly in this documentary. I think they sure. did a lot of things right. I think there was a lot of accuracies, but I don't think that it told the full story in my opinion. Sure. The way I did. There, I said of it. Course. And I don't well, care. I really don't. <laughs> I mean, this is why I said you should do it. I know. You should make one of your own. I really so that should. So there can actually be one that's accurate. And, you know, pro-China. Yeah. That'd be nice. Because that's part of the problem is that all of the documentaries that have been made about her had another agenda. There was mm. other agendas at play. Mm -hmm. And listen, I, you know. I think I have watched all of them at this point. Um, if there's something that I haven't that's come up in the past year or two, that's also possible. But yeah, no, you're right. It is a passion of mine. Yeah, it is a passion of mine. Well, I mean, first of all, that's my instinct is yep. number one. When is when is that happening? Because I'd yep. love to see that for you. Uh, and number two, um, I don't know much about current wrestling. Please. Because I have not uh, followed in many years. Um, so I don't even know if this person would be there, but do you know about Roman Reigns? I don't. You should. <laughs> I just <laughs> choked on my own saliva there. <laughs> um, I'm doing a quick, oh my God. <laughs> uh huh. Got it. Got yep. it. Okay. Yeah. Sure. yeah. I, uh, whoo. I don't even know. I don't even know. You know what's interesting? Mm. He has a, a similar um, placed tattoo as The Rock. And then mm -hmm. also in this other photo, he's wearing a very similar to John Cena suit. So what I'm hearing is he learned from the best. That's what I'm hearing also. What I hear. That's what I hear. Wow. 7.1 million followers on Instagram. You know, sure. again, I, I forget that while we tuned out of wrestling uh not many did oh yeah yeah and look i i just i don't even have a reason for why i stopped i think i just got more interested i love if this is the first thing i could think to say i got more interested in booze and boys <laughs> uh, yeah he did. And she that's did. why, because uh, I think around the time I stopped is when I turned legal to be able to go out and uh, legally drink. We were still watching it after that, weren't we? Oh, I, uh, when you. When did you move to Alberta? I was there in, two, I moved in 2000. I moved away in 2001. Huh. Okay. So when I moved home, I was legal. That <laughs> could have been said better. But my point is, that was when I was like, okay, I'm going to start going out. And, right. And let me tell you, I got a lot of stories 
that will never be said on this show. A lot of stories that will never be said publicly. Um, but gosh, folks, remember when you live in a small town, sometimes something as simple as going to pick up your mail at the post office will turn incredibly awkward 20-some years later. Sure. So just sure. know. That's a public service announcement if I've ever heard one. <laughs> For, for the for the for the youths, the youths yep. of today. Yep. And who knows? Maybe that's my penance for giving up on wrestling way back then. Maybe it would have kept you more on the straight and narrow. <laughs> He's straight and narrow now. For the love of God, I'm drinking a peach juice for peach juice. Yeah. Uh, I am who I am. So I. I was at, uh, I was getting groceries. This was, oh God, a month and a half probably ago. And I see this, this jug of peach juice. And I was like, ooh, that feels refreshing. I'm yeah. going to give it a go. Sure. Get it all, get all excited. My first glass and my first reaction is, oh, it's kind of weak, isn't it? Like, it's just like water with like a smack of peach. You know what I mean? So I was like, not really impressed, but I'm not a waster. Mm -hmm. So I finished that jug. And then I bought another one. <laughs> and then it was, huh. Okay. Still not like the best, the best, but like, it's okay. And then I got like really sick. Like I had some sort of like chest infection. And I just wanted to like lay down and I was like, you know what? I'm going to have a juice yeah, instead of just water all the time. I'll kind of have alternate, whatever. I bought fucking peach juice. <laughs> and then it suddenly turned into, I was having a glass of peach juice every morning. And yesterday I was like, Ooh, there's not very much peach juice left, but I had some. I was like, Oh, there's enough for me for tomorrow. But then I went, you know what? I'm actually getting groceries tomorrow. So I can have two glasses of peach <laughs> juice today. I'll just buy more tomorrow. So this morning I get up, go pull out my frosty mug because I like it nice and ice cold. Go to have my peach juice. Devastated because a hog had two glasses of it yesterday. <laughs> and so... I was pretty, pretty disappointed. <laughs> and the point is, I'm going through about two or three of these a week now. <laughs> uh, also checked it out. Zero, zero nutritional value. Um, no, no real juice. <laughs> but I'm going to say, um, <laughs> now it just hits the spot. <laughs> Here's what I love. I'm the same way. What I love is that you're like, this isn't, this isn't very good. I better try it again and again and again. That is absolutely how I live my life where it's like, I didn't like this thing. I'd better try it. That's like, yeah. there's this one place where I get ramen and it's delicious. And it absolutely makes my stomach hurt every time. And I've had it. I won't admit it. I won't admit it because I'm giving myself tummy aches and that's ridiculous. Of course grow up um mm -hmm. anyway long story short way too late that just really charmed me i i just love that you've gone from this isn't very good to now you have to buy multiple jugs a week you are literally buster bluth at this point going through juice or glenn sturgis for that matter oh shit you're right you're right and look, now when I'm having it, I'm like, oh, sweet touch of peach. I love <laughs> which is ridiculous. But also, I mean, I, I'm not going to sit here and bore the people with <laughs> a list of juices that I love uh, because I also haven't had time to really think about it. Of and course. I don't want to miss one. But if like gun to my head real quick, Apple or orange was always going to be a go-to. And my youngest, when we were in America, really, really developed a strong love of orange juice because his go-to thing, his favorite thing in the world to drink is iced tea. And I warned him so many times in advance of 
when we go there, iced tea tastes so different. You're not going to like it there, whatever. So he was scared to have iced tea on the plane, even though we were like in still in Canada in that moment. I was like, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, we bought iced tea at the airport that we took with us uh, to go um, so we could have Canadian iced tea uh, for whatever he wanted. But um, he then started like, I'm, go I'm just going to go orange juice. So we ended up buying orange juice for him when we came home. And I was like, here you go. I ran out of the peach. So I'm like, you know what? Orange juice will hit the spot. Too sweet. <laughs> You, you now you have a taste for the for the less sweet juice. Yeah, I have. It's it's the part of me that likes a routine. I think that I'm so broken about. Like I've started this year, I was like, it's not great, and now I'm like, oh, I have it every morning. This is the part of me that'll never ever ever give up on peach. Oh, I <laughs> I like that. I like that a lot. Thank but you. look, I don't know what it is. I don't know how this has happened. Sure. Tenacity. I didn't. Perseverance. Have the thing is, I have a teenager who will consume pretty much anything. I could have been like, hey, there's some juice. Go for it. And he probably would have finished it. I could have finished the jug and been done with it. But no, I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to try it again. And today I bought two <laughs> so that I'm guaranteed I can at least try and make it through the week. I'm not going to make it through the week on two. I'm probably going to need to go back partway through. Partway through. <laughs> I just could not love it more. I couldn't Again, love it more. Not a ounce of nutritional value. And I'm crushed by that because <laughs> I, I was hoping I was getting like a little bit of vitamin. No. 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 Now uh, listen. Nope. It's a mouth pleasure. Hey. Well, That's it is something... now after six jugs, it finally is. <laughs> That's something that I had an ex say to me in earnest. He said, I don't tend to eat for mouth pleasure. And I wanted to Stop. throw myself into traffic. Um, but listen, dear listeners, on that note, let's get into the case. Yeah. Let's get into the case. We're talking the case of Brian Ryan. And I'm going to give you a little bit of backstory right now. In July 1996, 31-year-old Brian Ryan, Ryan, so sorry, was found dead in his home in Montana. Believing that Brian's death was a, was a suicide, the local police made a lot of mistakes regarding the crime scene. After an autopsy, it was discovered that Brian had been murdered. Police immediately zeroed in on the girl that Brian had recently started seeing as the girl's ex-boyfriend had been stalking and harassing the new couple. So was Brian Ryan's murder a crime of passion or did the police blame the wrong person? We'll deep dive those questions and more as Christy gives us not one, but three true crime cases from the great state of Montana. Hey, yo. I don't know why that. Still high on peach juice, I think. I like that. Oh, so what I love is I know probably even just one, but at least one of our dear listeners is going to go to a store and be like, hey, peach juice, I wonder if that's the same stuff. And they're going to take a sip and go, I don't think I like it. I bet this is the same stuff. And who knows, maybe they'll just let it go and be like, it's not for me. Where is this? Well, like the look on my husband's face when I went to the cooler and pulled out two of them and just started walking to the cart. And he's like, I thought you hated it. What I like is two things. One, yeah. our our listeners are like us. They're not quitters. And I have a feeling any of them are going to yeah. drink it good. Two, I like yeah. that I've given the synopsis. You're still on the peace <laughs> tube. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> I'm upset at myself. No. While at the same time, so, so proud. <laughs> I'm proud of you. You didn't take no for an answer. And I like it's that. A, it's a delightful treat now, which... Now I'm like, shit, how many things have I tried once and gone, eh, and never again? Well, no more. Never again. And I'm going to try it till I'm sick without it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. That's healthy. It's the Ew. same concept as heroin. Just know that. <laughs> oh, that's, I, I could never touch a hard drug. I could of never. Of course. Of course. I'd be too scared because I've seen, I, I, I've seen the signs and, and my behaviors. Of course. 
and that would just be disaster. So that's where I'm at. I'm going to say I'm going to let it go, but I can't promise it's not going to come up later in this episode. I look forward to it. You do you, Peachy Boo. (laughs) I have to stop myself before I get like a tattoo of a peach. I've been planning to get one, so join me. It would be it would be an honor. Listen, it would be an honor. So, disclaimer, as always, this episode will contain mentions of suicide, so trigger warning for those who need it. Brian Allen Ryan was born February 14th, 1965, in Rocky Ford, Colorado. Brian's parents, Robert and Shirley Ryan, also had two daughters, Teresa and Charlene. Brian was the oldest of the three. In 1975, the Ryan family moved to Scott City, Kansas, where Brian graduated from Scott Community High School in 1983. Throughout his youth, Brian was part of 4-H and Future Farmers of America, where he developed a deep love of animals. After attending Colby Community College for two years, Brian went to Kansas State University, where he graduated with a degree in veterinary medicine. I was going to say science. I don't know why that just naturally went together uh, in May of 1991. Brian worked for Sork Veterinary Clinic in Scott City before moving to the small town of Geraldine, Montana in 1994. At the time, Geraldine had a population of about 300 people. According to the 2020 census, the population is closer to 207. In 1995, Brian, with financial help from his sister Charlene, opened his own veterinary clinic called Prairie Edges. Marlene Protzman helped Brian run the office. She also let Brian rent an unused single-wide trailer on her property about 11 miles or 18 kilometers outside of Geraldine. The trailer was referred to as the bunkhouse. On July 10th, 1996, Brian attended a veterinary conference in Bozeman, Montana. He returned home on the night of February, or sorry, Friday, July 12th. No one spoke with Brian or saw him on the Saturday. Then Sunday, July 14th, Marlene's husband, Richard, drove out to the bunkhouse to see if Brian wanted to accompany him to the pasture. Richard found Brian lying in a pool of blood on the floor of the kitchen. Richard drove the mile back to his house and yelled for Marlene to call 911. Richard said because Brian had taken his own life. After the phone call, Marlene and Richard drove back to the bunkhouse, where Marlene said she went inside and yelled, quote, he didn't shoot himself. He's been in a fight. Something bad has happened. Brian Ryan was 31 years old at the time of his death. He was described as smart, well-read, and protective of his sisters. Brian had a great love of animals, and those closest to him said he had a heart of gold. When police came to the scene, they found Brian on his back with his feet crossed at the ankle. On his left foot was a water shoe. The right foot was bare. The second water shoe was found on the front step, along with a broken button fragment and a few drops of blood. There was a 357 Magnum handgun on the floor next to Brian's left hand. Unfortunately, police first treated the scene as a suicide, so they didn't have concerns about compromising the scene, which is probably why some of the officers used towels to clean up the blood. They claimed they knew the victim's family would be arriving later that day and the police wanted to clean up the scene so it would be less distressing for the family to see. The bloody towels were then placed in garbage bags and discarded at the home of the undersheriff, Michael Paulino. Wow. The sheriff was attending some sort of training out of town, so Paulino uh, was left in charge of the scene. When notifying Brian's family, Paulino told them that Brian's death was a suicide, even though Paulino had yet to be at the crime scene. He was basing this solely on that 911 call. 
Police also didn't collect fingerprints or swab any blood samples when they first got to the scene. Only 12 photos were taken of the scene. When police discovered a phone receiver under Brian's body, they just threw it in the garbage with the bloody towels. They didn't take pictures of it or swab it first. The day after Brian's body was found, medical examiner Dr. Jack Henniford did an autopsy, which confirmed that Brian's death was actually a homicide. In fact, it looked like there had been a struggle, as Brian's shirt was ripped. He had multiple abrasions and contusions on his head, including his forehead, the back of his head, and the bridge of his nose. Brian's right eye was also swollen. Brian was shot twice in the lower right forearm and once in the chest. The shots on the forearm were parallel to each other and the chest wound apparently was the fatal blow. Dr. Hannaford said he believed the arm injuries were defensive wounds. However, he couldn't determine the position of Brian's arm when the shots were fired. But all three shots were fired at close range and in fairly quick succession. It was estimated that Brian could have lived up to 15 minutes after the fatal chest wound, although it is possible he was unconscious for part of that time. Brian's manner of death was ruled a homicide. However, Dr. Hennifer could not determine a time of death due to multiple variables, including the fact that Brian's body was placed in a cooled storage at the morgue for several hours before the autopsy was conducted. Dr. Hennifer said, quote, I didn't feel comfortable trying to make an estimate. According to phone records, Brian took a phone call on Friday night at 10.15 p.m., and he wasn't seen by anyone until his body was found Sunday. So it's unclear if Brian was killed late Friday night or sometime Saturday. By the time police returned to the crime scene after learning the case was in fact a homicide, the scene had been left unattended for 24 hours. Wonderful. The garbage bags containing the bloody towels and the phone receiver were never recovered. Which leads me to ask, how were those bags disposed of in less than a day? I'm just assuming someone must have outright burned them. I would assume that. Because how else would you not have had any way to just be like, we're going to take those bags to at least look at something? I don't know. While the scene was treated like an actual crime scene, hairs, fibers, and fingerprints were finally obtained, although I question the legitimacy of them since the scene wasn't immediately secured. We also don't know how many officers went through that crime scene before it was determined to be a homicide. But investigators used dowel rods and fluorescent string to try and determine the trajectory of the bullets since two bullets were found lodged in the wall near the washer and dryer, police hypothesized those first two shots were fired from the front step. And since there was a water shoe on Brian's foot and another on the front step and a fishing pole near the front door, police believe Brian was headed out fishing when he was confronted by his killer. The idea is that Brian came face to face with his killer while leaving his home. The killer shot him twice in the arm and Brian possibly ran into the kitchen to call 911, which would explain the placement of the phone receiver under his body. The killer then likely followed Brian into the trailer and shot him a third time. The broken button fragment and drops of blood on the front step are also good indicators that that is where that struggle started. The gun found at the scene had been cleaned with a solvent, so no fingerprints were found on it. When Brian's sister Charlene visited the crime scene, she identified the gun as belonging to Brian. However, she questioned the location of the gun's case. Brian always kept the gun in a leather case that he had made himself. It was decorated with his initials. Police did a search of the area around Brian's trailer, and 84 feet from the front door, Brian's leather gun case was found in some tall grass. Until then, police believed the killer might have taken the gun from Brian during the struggle, but now that the gun case was found so far from the trailer, 
Police believe the killer took the gun at some point while Brian was out of town, which would have been easy because Brian's trailer was never locked. The police hypothesized the killer waited in the grass, and when Brian returned, they dropped the case and took the gun to the trailer. If this is correct, then Brian's death was premeditated. Yes. <clears throat> but police still couldn't determine if Brian was killed on Friday or Saturday. Brian took that phone call at 10.15 p.m. Friday night. The call ended at 10.40. The woman on the call was 21-year-old Ann Wishman, a woman that Brian had met at a bar in Geraldine called Rusty's. Ann said out of nowhere that Brian... Bre While on the phone, Ann said out of nowhere, <laughs> Brian said, quote, I've got to go, and he hung up before she was even able to say goodbye. Is it possible that the killer came to his door and that's why he ended the call so quickly? Now, before we get further into this, I want to focus for a moment on Ann Wishman. Brian was very close with his family and in constant contact with them. So whenever he talked to his sister, Teresa, she would always ask if Brian was seeing anyone in town. According to Teresa, Brian would always say there were some girls, but he hadn't met the one yet. Shortly before his death, Teresa asked about potential girlfriends again. Brian told her there was one girl, but she was just someone who does things for him. When Teresa asked Brian to clarify, he said he's got this girl that sometimes comes over and cleans his house. Yeah, that girl was 21-year-old Ann Wishman. When Ann and Brian first met, Ann was in a relationship with her boyfriend, 23-year-old Tom Jarazeski. Ann and Tom were high school sweethearts who had been dating for four and a half years. They lived together in Great Falls, which is about 67 miles or 108 kilometers east of Geraldine. During the first conversation, Anne told Brian about her relationship problems, and Brian said that Anne was too young to settle down. Anne later said that Brian made her realize she wasn't happy in her relationship with Tom and she wanted to end things. She said she had felt that way for a long time, but it took Brian to make her realize it. Shortly after that first meeting, Brian called Anne's house and left a message on her machine, which, because they lived together, Tom heard. Tom immediately called Anne to ask her what was going on. Anne refused to answer, and instead she moved back to her family farm in Geraldine. When Tom was later questioned by police, he said he heard the message and called Anne. This is a quote from Tom. Quote, he said, you got a call from Brian. She didn't say anything. What the hell is going on? She didn't say anything. So I said, you cheated on me, you tramp. Which is kind of an escalation there, Tom. Yeah. But Tom quit his job in Great Falls and moved to his family's farm in Geraldine. Tom then obsessively started calling Anne, her friends, her family, and even some of Brian's ex-girlfriends, demanding to know what was going on with Brian. Tom's behavior escalated from there. One day, Anne agreed to go for a ride with Tom in his new truck, and Tom refused to let Anne out of the vehicle. At one point when no one was home, Tom snuck into Anne's house and read her diary. He then called Anne and quoted from it to prove to her that he had read it. One night, Tom showed up at Brian's house in the middle of the night and claimed he had car trouble and he needed to use the phone. And if that's not odd behavior enough, Anne claims that Tom once told her if she ever cheated on him, Tom said, quote, I'll kill him and I'll kill you. Wow. Anne said after their breakup, she was terrified of Tom. Odd things had also been happening to Brian. After he started casually seeing Anne, a rock was thrown through the window of Brian's clinic. Then he started receiving random phone calls where the caller would just hang up. Tom admitted to police that he threw the rock through the clinic's window, and he continually called Brian and hung up. Tom also admitted to snooping in Anne's house and reading her diary. Tom said, quote, it was wrong of me to do that. 
I wanted to see her thoughts, what she had to say about me, what she had to say about Brian. Tom also admitted to showing up at Anne's house on his ATV, just hoping, quote, to catch a glimpse of her. Anne's brother chased Tom off, but Tom was adamant that he did not show up at Brian's house late at night faking car trouble. When Tom was first interviewed by police, he claimed he was worried about Anne being around Brian because Brian was a veterinarian and had access to drugs. Oh, boy. Which is, no offense, one of the dumbest things <laughs> I've ever heard. If Lauren contacted me and was like, hey, I met this guy. Uh, we're going on a date. He's a veterinarian. I'm going to go, good for you. Oh, that's Am a I dream. Gonna go, oh, I don't know. He's linked to drugs. I mean, yeah, that's a bit of a, I think that's a bit of a stretch. Yeah. Yeah. Look, it's called jealousy, Tom. Yeah. It's okay. We've all felt it. We've all sure. Felt it. So on the night that Brian returned home from the conference, Tom admitted to calling him around 9.45 p.m. Tom claims he called Brian just to say he would no longer interfere with their relationship and he had no ill feelings for Brian. The timing of that call feels, I don't know, suspicious to yeah. me? Yeah. But Tom claims he remained at home for the rest of the night. Tom had no alibi for the Friday night. He did have a solid alibi for the Saturday, though. During the day on Saturday, Tom went to a hospital for intense back pain. Tom claims he fell out of his truck the day before and hurt his back. But did he fall out of a truck or did he hurt his back in a scuffle with Tom or with Brian, rather? Yeah, that's a question I have. Uh, police brought in a bloodhound named Calamity Jane which I love. Adorable. Uh, and her handle and her handler, they came to the scene about 10 days after Brian's body was found. The dog got a scent from Tom's baseball cap and followed the scent from Brian's front door to the spot where the gun holster was found in the grass, 84 feet away. The dog continued to follow the scent to a shelter belt area, which is like a series of trees and bushes that protect an area from the elements. The area looked as though someone stood there for a long period of time. In 1998, Tom was re-interviewed about Brian's case. During the interview, Tom finally admitted, you know what, he actually did show up at Brian's house late one night pretending to have car trouble. And the whole reason was he just wanted to see if Anne was there. Wow. Soon after, Tom was taken to Fort Benton, where he was charged with deliberate homicide. But then it was discovered that the bloodhound and her handler were not properly certified, so the judge ruled the bloodhound's evidence to be inadmissible. And since none of the DNA or fingerprints found in Brian's house were a match to Tom, he was released. However, when the judge dismissed the charges against Tom, he did so without prejudice, which means Tom could be charged again in the future. When Tom returned to Geraldine, he realized that he'd never be able to escape the dark cloud of Brian Ryan. So to move on with his life, Tom moved to Sioux Falls, South Dakota in 1999. He got married in Vegas, had two sons, and got divorced in 2008. Tom's ex-wife took out a protection order against him that same year, alleging domestic abuse. The order was dropped in 2009. After Brian's death, Anne couldn't handle living in Montana either, although her main reason for leaving was because she didn't want to live near Tom. Without realizing that Tom had also moved, Anne went to visit her sister in Arkansas and just decided to stay while she was there. Thirteen years after Brian's murder, Brant Light, a chief prosecutor with the Montana Attorney General's Office, was appointed to the new job of handling cold cases. Brandt decided to take a fresh look at Brian's case, so evidence was resubmitted to the crime lab and witnesses and potential suspects were all re-interviewed. And despite no new evidence coming to light, 
Tom was arrested on April 30th, 2014, and was booked into the Minnehaha County Jail as a fugitive from justice before being extradited to Montana to face the charge of deliberate homicide. Wowzer! Yeah. Well, the plot thickens. Yeah. And you know what else does? My bladder. Let's go take a break, hit the can, grab another drink, and we're going to be right back with more on the Brian Ryan case of this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. All right, clap two on three. One, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're, of course, discussing the case of Brian Ryan. Little update on my end. I went to get another high noon. I was drinking a high noon earlier just because I wanted to get a slight buzz on. And what did I see buried in the back of that fridge but an ice cold Diet Coke? So guess what? Also have a Gatorade going. I don't know anymore. I don't know. I 100% thought what you found in the back of the fridge was peach juice. <laughs> I've never heard you mention peach juice before. I don't think I've ever drank it. I don't yeah. think I've ever mentioned it to you before today. So why? Why did I think that's what you were going to say? Because this is what's happened. It seeped. It has seeped into my brain. Yeah. Oh you're you're steeped. Oh, God. Now I'm I'm belching again like last week. I never belch on this show. And this is two weeks in a row. Maybe it's good luck. Anyway. All right. Yeah. So this man has been charged again. Tom has he been has. charged again. He has. Let's get into it. Yeah. So Tom Jarazeski's trial starts September 11th, 2015 in Fort Benton. <coughs> so one of the big things mentioned uh, was the investigator's initial mishandling of the crime scene, which I can't even tell you that when I first heard that, the screaming that emitted from my body of like, what did you do? I I can't. So three officers testified that the coroner told a deputy and the undersheriff to clean up a pool of blood that was under the victim's head. The coroner suggested this to prevent the trailer from smelling and to spare the victim's family from having to clean it later themselves. Michael Paulino, the undersheriff, testified that they bagged the bloody towels and the phone receiver that was found and disposed of them at his home. Douglas Williams, who was the sheriff at the time of Brian's death, was training out of town that day, so he didn't personally visit the crime scene. Since Williams was away at the time, Paulino was in charge of the scene, so I don't know why the police followed the coroner's lead on this, especially when, in 1996, when this crime occurred, the coroner's office was not affiliated with the sheriff's office. So that also doesn't... Why listen to that Yeah. Person? <clears throat> but during the trial, Williams was asked about the unwritten policy regarding the cleanup of bloody crime scenes. And Williams said, quote, There were certain times we would clean it up. Williams said that in 1998 or 2000, his office stopped cleaning up crime scenes and started using a special cleaning service after the scenes were cleared. The fact that he chose to specifically say, well, uh, they w we had the special cleaning service come in after. It's like, so were you always cleaning it up before then? Did you ever wait till after? I have so many questions. Yeah. Public defender Bob Peterson asked Williams about the training he received prior to 1996 regarding coroner duties and homicide investigations. Peterson asked whether they were told cleaning the crime scene was appropriate. Williams said no. Williams was outright asked if cleaning a crime scene and throwing away evidence was against the training he received. Williams said yes. I also have a lot of questions on why it got disposed of at a police officer's home. Yep. But, you know, that's just tally that up for one of the many questions we always have on this show. Oh, God, yeah. So Marlene, 
who worked for Ryan, said she received two phone calls at the vet clinic on July 12th, the day that Brian was possibly killed. First, it was Brian calling to tell her he was returning earlier than expected and he was leaving Bozeman shortly. A second call came in from an unnamed male whose voice Marlene didn't recognize. The man asked if Brian was there. Marlene told him Brian was on his way back. She asked the man if he wanted to leave a message. He said no. The state tried to claim that call came from Tom to determine if Brian would be home that night. And to that I say, did they check phone records to prove that? Surely phone records would prove what calls were made that day from Tom's phone. No one's ever said publicly if they checked oh, it. God. I need to believe that they have, but I can't guarantee it. The state believed that Tom called Brian's house and hung up on the night of July 12th to see if Brian was home, and that Tom then called Anne's house in Great Falls and hung up just to make sure she wasn't with Brian. The state then argued that Tom rode his ATV to Brian's bunkhouse and shot him. One of the neighbors told police he saw an ATV driving in the area late Friday night. Police were never able to determine whose ATV the witness may have seen. A police investigator testified that when they searched the area surrounding Brian's home, they found footprints in the shelter belt area, which had a perfect view of the trailer. The prints were flagged, and the investigators attempted to make casts of the prints. However, the investigators admitted that the casts were, were flawed and dissolved. But during the trial, an officer told the jury he noticed a distinct pattern in the prints, and he drew said pattern in his notes. The officer claimed that when searching through items seized from Tom's house, he came across a pair of shoes that matched the pattern of the prints. The defense argued that they had never heard this information before, but the state claimed it was all noted in the evidence log. But then the judge told the jury, quote, Based on evidence and expert testing, no footwear impressions were found at the scene or near the trailer that matched any shoes belonging to Jarazeski. The state pointed out several inconsistencies in Tom's statement to police and also pushed Tom's harassment and stalking. They pointed out that Tom continued to pursue Anne, even after Brian's death, and that he sent her multiple letters and even, and I don't know how this worked, but he used a vacuum cleaner salesman to get Anne's new phone number. That's wild. Even after Tom moved to another state and started seeing someone else, Tom outright told that new girlfriend that he was still in love with Anne and he blamed Brian for taking Anne away from him. Oh, boy. Tom then told this woman he wished that Brian was dead, which by that point he already was. So that statement makes zero sense to me. But the state, pointed out that Tom didn't have an alibi for Friday night, the night they believed that Brian was killed. The defense, however, pushed the narrative that Brian was killed Saturday night, not Friday, especially since Tom had an alibi for right. Saturday. Brian's dog, Cody, was found in the trailer, and since the dog had not gone to the bathroom anywhere inside that trailer, the defense believed this meant that Brian was alive Friday night to be able to let the dog out. Is it possible the dog had its own way in and out of the trailer? What happened to the dog while Brian was out of town at the conference? Why was the dog never mentioned in the reports prior to the trial? Was the dog found in the trailer? I have so many questions and so few answers because you can't tell me that a, a dog's owner would lay dead for days or hours, and a dog wouldn't notice in the same house. Well, yeah, but also some dogs will hold it. Like, it will hold it for very, very long times. Yep. Like, if he's trying to be a good boy or a good girl, like, they, there are some dogs who are so trained, depending on the breed. <laughs> the little ones I have, 
but they'll piss and shit in this house after an hour if they need to. But another dog, like there's absolute, that is bullshit. There's absolutely nothing scientific to back that up. Yep. Oh, I agree. Uh, the defense also found two witnesses who now claimed on July 12th, around 7 p.m., they saw Brian having dinner at the Square Butte Country Club. And even though this wasn't asked until 19 years later, both witnesses could clearly recall seeing Brian that night eating a steak at the club. And I just want to know why it took so many years for those witnesses to be found. Geraldine was a very small town. How did this information not come to light earlier? And how on earth do those men remember what Brian was eating almost 20 years ago? Honestly, I do not remember what I ate for lunch yesterday. But they remember what he was eating? That feels weird. According to Brian's autopsy, there was no steak in his digestive tract. Here we go. There was, however, scrambled eggs, tomato, and green pepper in Brian's stomach. According to the photos of the crime scene, there were eggshells in the kitchen garbage can and dirty dishes in the sink. So is that proof that Brian was alive Saturday morning and he made himself breakfast? Is it possible Brian made himself eggs late at night on Friday? On September 23rd, after nearly eight hours of deliberation, the jury found Tom Jarazeski not guilty. The verdict was unanimous. So if Tom wasn't the killer, who else might be? Well, first we've got Larry Hagenbush, a close friend of Brian's, who was actually the person who suggested that Brian move to Montana in the first place. Larry had some mental health struggles as his wife had left him and he started drinking heavily and tried to take his own life using animal medication that he got from Brian. Ooh. Now, I don't know if Brian gave Larry the medication or if Larry took it without Brian's knowledge. The day after Brian's body was found, Larry's behavior was described as erratic. He was overheard by two witnesses at a marriage counseling session describing the crime scene in great detail, despite the fact that he allegedly had not been there. According to the witnesses, Larry said Brian was on his back with his feet crossed, which was not public knowledge at the time. Larry also told a woman on Monday morning that Brian had been shot with his own gun. But at that point in the investigation, even the police didn't know that. So how would Larry know that? In court, Larry claimed he was in shock over his friend's death, and he denied ever having said anything to anyone about Brian's gun. One of the witnesses who worked at the marriage counselor's office testified that Larry was crying hysterically when he described the scene. Larry said he overstated what he had witnessed at the crime scene while trying to, quote, be a big dog in front of the women at the counseling office. Oh, God. Two things. One, when and why were you at the crime scene, Larry? And two, Describing the scene in exact detail was overstating it. Forgive me for saying, but you're coming across a bit suspicious, Larry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd agree with you there. Also, um, third thing that I'm adding in, if you're there for marriage counseling, maybe don't try and big dog it in front of other women. Yeah, I like that he's trying to impress other women when he's there for a couples therapy session. I mean, again, this is not helping credibility. No. But something I found interesting that didn't seem to be a big deal in court was one of those witnesses was the sister of Tom Jarazeski. Oh. Who would have a huge motive to try yep. and direct blame towards someone else. I am not suggesting that she lied. I'm just suggesting it's interesting and how the state didn't point it out that it's like, well, one of the, I know it's a small town, but it's one of the witnesses is, I mean, come on. Yep. It's, I mean, to me, it's like, oh, I wouldn't have used her as a witness then. 
Yeah, I wouldn't have. But again, not even close to being a lawyer. Like, uh, I think you're close. close. I think you're closer than you'd think. Well, I'm a step away from Elle Woods. No, I'm not. Stop it. Yep. God, what I wouldn't give for that tiny dog. Anyhow. So. Larry's description of the scene seemed exact. But then he kept changing his story with police. At first, he said it was a pistol at the scene. Then he said it was a rifle. At one point, he said the trailer walls were full of holes. Then he said there were just two. Every time he was interviewed, his story changed. Something about Larry is that he had an alibi for Friday night. But he did not have an alibi for all day Saturday. So if the defense was correct and Brian was killed on Saturday, then Larry starts to look like more of a potential suspect. But what would Larry's motive be? Did he go to Brian for medication and Brian said no? Did he show up hoping to take the medication while Brian wasn't home and then was surprised to find Brian there? There were rumors that Larry was bad-mouthing Brian while drinking at a local bar just before Brian's death. Larry, of course, denies that. No fingerprints or DNA found at the scene was a match for Larry. So, as of March 2023, Larry has not been charged in connection with Brian's murder. So if the killer wasn't Tom, and if it wasn't Larry, who are other potential suspects? Well, if gossip about Brian's love life were believed to be true, it's possible a random woman or her partner could have been the killer. There were rumors around Geraldine that Brian was a womanizer who had multiple affairs. Brian's family denies this. There wasn't a lot of proof. However, a woman named Jody Thorson testified during Tom's trial that she and Brian were good friends for about a year and that they had been in a romantic relationship for about five months prior to Brian's death. Jody testified she suspected that Brian was dating another woman while they were together and their relationship began to deteriorate in May of 1996. Brian allegedly canceled a trip at the last minute that they had planned to take to Yellowstone. Jody said she went on the trip by herself and while she was gone, she got a job offer in Gardner, Montana. Jody decided to take the job but admits she was hurt when she discovered that Brian started dating Ann Wishman just days after Jody left town, even though Jody says she and Brian had not discussed breaking up yet. Ooh. Gardner is about 240 miles or 386 kilometers south of Geraldine. So maybe Brian translated the move to mean they were broken up. She took the job. I assume had not mentioned anything to him about it before. Suddenly it was, oh, hey, yeah, I'm moving. Maybe he took that as like, this is it. It's possible. Um, but of course, we don't know Brian's side of any of their relationship. So who's to say? Jody's sister, Jennifer, said that Brian was a womanizer and said t as much to Tom Jarazeski when he called her asking about Brian. And yes, Tom called Jennifer, not once, but twice even though they didn't know each other. He was trying to look for information about Brian because he couldn't accept his girlfriend left him for a handsome, successful vet. I mean. And judging by his behavior, it's like, it sounds like maybe you were a bit of a, bit of a tough guy to be with, Tom. Sorry. It's, it, uh, there's a lot of problems. There's a lot of problems here, Tom. Tom allegedly contacted Jennifer the first time to try and get in touch with Jody. He then called her the second time to talk about Brian and Anne's relationship, which I'll say it was neither of their business. No. <clears throat> oh, I was doing so well there. Yeah. <clears throat> ah, but I stand by it. Yep. Even if he was talking to Jody, about Brian and Anne's relationship. It wasn't Jody's business either. But it's especially you know not the business of Jody's sister. 
Tom's sister should have really talked to Tom about maybe getting into that therapy office because it just feels like his fixation on Anne. Let's say that Tom was innocent, but just for argument's sake. Sure. Boy, oh boy, oh, did he ever make himself look <laughs> real guilty. Like you really did not serve yourself, Tom, with all of this behavior. It's it's wild. It's wild. I will admit one of the things he never said uh, in a, uh, I think, a Dateline episode that I watched about this. Tom never once said, like, I don't know why they went after me. It's like, he knew. <laughs> It everybody knows, Tom. Everybody knows. Everybody knows. Uh, for some reason, during Tom's contact with Jody and her sister, Tom admitted to them he snuck into Anne's house and read her diary, which is maybe a red flag for no longer speaking to that man. Uh, Jody said she would have contacted Brian personally if she felt his life was in any danger. Jennifer told Tom that Brian dated at least three women in short succession, and she didn't personally like how he treated women. I don't know if Jennifer ever met Brian in person or if she was just going off stories she heard. Uh, again, we don't know Brian's side of it. We don't like rumors. Uh, keep in mind, I did say these were rumors, so we don't know. Yeah. I just want to say I, I'm not saying anything that Brian did anything wrong. Is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Because we don't know. Jody was asked to give detailed accounts as to her whereabouts on the weekend that Brian died, including submitting fingerprints, hair samples, and work time cards. Jody testified she expected that her hair would be found in Brian's trailer, but it wasn't. Which is also an odd thing to be like, obviously my hair will be there. Yeah. When he died in July and... They last saw each other in May. Yeah. So it's weird to say you expected it, but is it possible Jody was so angry at Brian that she shot him? Was her sister angry enough to do it for her? I am not accusing anyone. I'm just speculating. What if Brian was seeing multiple women? What if one of those women learned about the others and got angry? What if Brian was seeing a woman who's partner boyfriend husband whatever learned about the affair and wanted revenge allegedly police found unidentified dna in the underwear that brian was wearing interesting to the best of my knowledge police have not determined who that dna belonged to is it possible brian had a guest over friday and another woman caught him with her the next morning and got angry yeah. And what about Ann Wishman? <coughs> she left a long-term relationship to be with Brian. What if she showed up at his trailer and found him with another woman? Would she be angry enough to shoot him? Again, only speculating. Yep. Ann said that to this day, she carries immense guilt over what happened to Brian. On that episode of Dateline I watched, Anne said she hoped that she wouldn't feel guilty anymore if Tom was convicted. Which was an odd way of putting it to me. If Anne felt guilty because she believed Tom killed Brian over her, then why would Tom's conviction make her feel less guilty? If anything, proving that Tom killed Brian because of her would make her feel more guilty. Maybe she meant she'd feel less guilty if he was acquitted. It's possibly she just misspoke, but it's just one of those things where I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense to me. No. Anne outright said that she didn't leave Tom for Brian, but that Brian gave her the courage to end an unhealthy relationship. And yes, Anne was said to be devastated by Brian's death. She even attended his funeral in Kansas, which apparently Brian's sisters were upset about. Hmm. I've seen so many articles of people who were like, oh, well, they were so in love. And it's like, well, not according to his sisters. So I just find it interesting that that's the path some have taken. And yeah, I also find it interesting that the sisters would be angry about anybody who would show up. I yeah. guess maybe early on they 
thought maybe it was Tom. And so they blamed her. Maybe that's why they were upset about it. But something I find interesting. Please. A long hair was found at the crime scene. The medical examiner testified that he found a hair inside the bag that had been placed around Brian's left hand before he was transported to the morgue. A zoomed-in photo from the crime scene was shown during Tom's trial, which showed the hair in Brian's left hand, which was on the floor beside the murder weapon. When the hair was tested, it was found to be a match to Ann Wishman. My question is, how did the hair get there? Did it fall off someone when they placed the gun on the floor? Because remember, that gun was wiped down with a solvent and then placed near the body after his after Brian's death. So could that mean that Anne placed the gun there? I mean, it could also mean someone close to Anne did it, or someone that was attempting to frame Anne, even. Anne said she wasn't told the hair found at the scene was hers until months before this trial. No other evidence at the scene was linked to Ann Wishman. As of March 2023, Ann has never been charged in connection with Brian's death. And unfortunately, between police mistakes at the beginning of this investigation and the fact that no time of death could be determined, it's unlikely that Brian Ryan's case will ever be solved unless the killer ever confesses I don't think Brian's family will ever get closure or the justice that they're hoping for. Now, it's going to seem early for me to say this, but that is all the information I could find about the Brian Ryan case. But this is not the end of this episode. I decided, if I'm already talking about true crime cases from Montana, I would bring even more true crime from Montana. Now, these, Bless. I have two more cases for you. They are not connected in any way to Brian Ryan. They just happen to take place in the same state. I just thought, since we're here, we might like a little bit extra. So, the first case takes place in Poplar, Montana. On the morning of June 16th, 1979, police found a truck belonging to the Nice family at a well-known party spot half a mile outside of town. Police followed a trail of blood from the truck to the Poplar River, where they found the body of 17-year-old Kimberly Ann Niece. There was no sign of robbery or sexual assault, but Kimberly suffered 21 blows to the head. Wow. Her sweater was found folded neatly near the back of the truck with her purse and a pack of cigarettes placed on top. Police found multiple multiple footprints in and around the trail, as well as more than two dozen fingerprints in the truck, including a bloody palm print on the passenger door. Now, since Kimberly was school valedictorian, people in Poplar believed she was killed by three or four jealous classmates. One potential suspect was 17-year-old Barry Allen Beach, who had previously dated Kimberly's sister. Barry was interviewed by police, but not charged. Shortly after Kimberly's murder, Barry moved in with his father in Louisiana. In 1983, Barry's stepmother called police, saying Barry helped his stepsister skip school. Barry was arrested for contributing to the delinquency of a minor. While looking into Barry's background, police discovered he'd been questioned about Kimberly's murder, which made police interrogate Barry about murders of three local women. Bit of a leap, but I yeah. can't. At first, Barry denied any involvement in the murders, but after two days of questioning, he confessed to Kimberly's murder, as well as that of the three Louisiana women. He was later cleared of the Louisiana murders after it was discovered he was not even in the state at the time of the crimes. Barry was charged with first-degree murder of Kimberly Niece, but he pleaded not guilty at the trial in 1984, arguing that his confession was coerced, and the detectives used aggressive techniques and graphic threats of the electric chair. Oh my god. 
During the trial, the Poplar police chief admitted that a police officer broke into a sealed evidence room the night after Kimberly's murder. And since that police officer was the father of one of the early potential suspects, the evidence that had been collected from the crime, including a pubic hair found on Kimberly's sweater, was now inadmissible in court. Wonderful. But despite that, the prosecutor made the claim that the pubic hair found at the scene belonged to Barry Beach. The prosecutor even stated the claim again during his closing statement, and when the footprints found at the scene did not match Barry, the prosecutor claimed the prints likely belonged to the police. The prosecutor said the proof that Barry was guilty was the fact that Barry knew exactly what Kimberly was wearing the night of her murder. Barry said Kimberly was wearing a brown sports jacket and a plaid blouse. In reality, Kimberly was wearing a blue and red blazer and a white sweater. Oh, my God. The tape of Barry's confession had been erased, so a transcript of the confession was read out loud instead. Barry maintained it was coerced. In the confession, Barry claimed that he put Kimberly's body in a garbage bag, feet first, and dragged her to the river by her shoulders. However, based on the evidence at the crime scene, Kimberly was likely dragged from the truck by her feet. There was also no sign of a garbage bag anywhere near the scene. Another inconsistency between Barry's confession and the actual crime is that Barry said Kimberly's truck was parked right next to the river. It was actually parked 257 feet away. In Barry's confession, he claimed to have choked Kimberly to death, but there was no sign uh, found in the autopsy of any asphyxiation. Barry also claimed he wiped his fingerprints from the truck, but it was covered in fingerprints. The detective who interrogated Barry in Louisiana was accused of misconduct in multiple cases, including soliciting false testimony in another case. He was suspended without pay at least four separate times, threatened with the possibility of termination twice, placed on a one-year probation, and ordered to undergo a neurological exam to determine whether anything was, quote, organically or physically wrong with his ability to think and remember. Terrifying detective side note. The detective in question, John Via, known as Jay, retired from the sheriff's office after what he considered to be 29 years of impeccable service. Jay claims people were trying to smear him because all other legal avenues for Barry Beach had failed. However, the misconduct I just mentioned included the suspensions and uh, neurological exams were in Jay's impeccable record. And it was even said that he had a problem when it came to investigative reports because it turns out he just didn't submit them. Oh, good Lord. Even his own partner admitted that that was a really big problem that Jay had. In May 1986, Jay's partner, who was also the same man who helped interrogate Barry in Louisiana, said that Jay, quote, has a bad track record as far as making reports. It was unacceptable. Impeccable service. Turns yeah. out Jay also got confessions from two felons regarding the murders of those three women from Louisiana that they originally tried to blame on Barry Beach. In 2007, DNA officially proved that neither of those confessions were true. The real killer was found to be in Monroe, Louisiana, serving a sentence for burglary. After deliberating for six hours, the jury found Barry Beach guilty oh. of Kimberly Niece's murder. He was sentenced to 100 years without parole. In 2000, a group called Centurion Ministries agreed to reinvestigate Barry's conviction. Their investigators discovered that multiple people had testified to say a group of girls confessed to killing Kimberly. One of the girls, Dottie Sue Atkinson, allegedly confessed to her brother that she killed Kimberly because Kimberly started a romantic relationship with Dottie's ex-boyfriend. None of the fingerprints found in the truck belonged to Dottie. In 2005, Centurion requested to do DNA testing on the evidence from the crime scene, which included the pubic hair. There was also a bloody towel, cigarette butts, 
Kimberly's jacket, and more than 100 slides of hair found at the scene. However, DNA testing could not be done as the evidence had all gone missing. <sighs> Centurion applied for clemency on Barry's behalf in August 2006. A year later, the Montana Board of Pardons and Paroles rejected the application, claiming that, quote, no proof of innocence or nearly discovered evidence of non-guilt was presented. Just read the original trial transcript, sir, and or madam. Yep. And you'll, you'll see, but okay. In November 2009, the Montana Supreme Court ordered an evidentiary Barry hearing for Barry's case. In August 2011, Barry appeared before the court for a retrial. New witnesses were called, including a girl who was just 10 at the time of the crime. The girl claims to have witnessed the murder, stating she saw a patrol car pull up to the scene after the murder, so she assumed it was unnecessary for her to go to the police, because the police already knew about it. Another witness claimed, to, claimed that Dottie Atkinson and her friend Joanne Jackson were responsible, but the state of Montana believed the new witnesses were not credible, and none of the evidence exonerated Barry. In November 2011, a judge ruled there was clear and convincing evidence that a jury could find Barry innocent, and Barry was granted a new trial. Barry was released pending the new trial. Barry started his own maintenance company and became the head of maintenance at a hotel. After a retrial in May 2013, the Montana Supreme Court reinstated Barry's conviction in a 4-3 to three decision. He was returned to prison. In April 2014, Barry's lawyer applied for commutation from Montana's Board of Pardons and Parole. At the time, the governor of Montana could only decide whether a prisoner's sentence could be commuted in a non-death penalty case if the board recommended commutation. Hundreds of people wrote letters to various senators asking for them to support Barry's petition for clemency, but in June 2014, his application was rejected. In October of that year, Barry's lawyer requested that Barry be resentenced by the Supreme Court as they felt the original judge did not take into account the fact that Barry was a minor at the time of the crime and a 100-year sentence left no opportunity for release. In January 2015, the Montana House approved House Bill 43, which says the governor can consider any clemency application regardless of what the board says montana was the eighth state to pass such a bill which came into existence because of barry beach's case in november 2015 steve bullock the governor of montana commuted barry's sentence to time served plus an additional 10 years probation barry was released after serving 30 years. Oh my god. For a crime he potentially did not commit. And well, Barry... and as we as we talk about sorry to interrupt, as we yeah, talk yeah. about on this show, the thing that I'm always passionate about is there was reasonable doubt. It does not matter. Yeah. There was reasonable doubt he should not have been convicted. Period. Especially when they're like, "Well, you know how we know he did it." He knew what she was wearing at the time. What was she wearing? She was wearing this. No, she was wearing that. Like you, stop it. Oh, as you know, nothing gets me fired up more than, well, apparently China and uh, the wrestler, not the country, of and uh, injustice. But it, it, China follows, follows under that umbrella anyway, so. She does, but yeah. I like that a lot. I like your uh, anger over injustice. Well, this, because again, I listen, I'm a broken record. I'll, I won't. I won't stay on this long, but my point just is, is that the judicial system exists for a reason. It is to protect us as well as, uh, you know, take care of crimes that have been committed. But it only works if people follow the the, the system. That's what gets me crazy. Yep. Oh, 100 percent. And if Barry is innocent, that means that Kimberly Niece's real killer has never been caught. Yep. And we're going to be fired up about that. Well, I'm going to bring you another case. You didn't oh, ask for it, but you're getting it anyway. Wonderful. This one's from Darby, Montana. William Lee Stout, known as Bill, was born February 1955 in San Jose, California. 
In the mid-80s, Bill met a woman named Anne, who had a son named Ben from a previous marriage. Bill and Anne were married around 1986, and Bill adopted Ben as his own. Anne later gave birth to Noah and Matthew. The family moved to Montana around 1999, where Bill worked as a drywall installer. Sadly, on January 11th, 2000, Ben took his own life. He was just 18 at the time. Ben's death caused a rift between Anne and Bill, who started fighting a lot. For unknown reasons, Bill seemed to blame Anne for Ben's death. On June 10th, 2007, Anne took her son Matthew shopping. When they returned home in the late afternoon, Anne discovered Bill dead in their bedroom. He was in the bed, under the sheets, with a single gunshot wound to the head. He was 52 years old and a beloved member of his community. Anne drove to a neighbor's house and hysterically called 911. I do not know why she didn't just call from her own home. Mm -hmm. I also don't know why she didn't walk across the street. I don't know why specifically she drove. Maybe they lived further out and not right next door to somebody. But mm -hmm. the police were able to rule out the possibility of suicide as the gun wasn't found at the scene. The evidence seemed to suggest that Bill's body had been moved after his death. The coroner initially believed that Bill may have been killed eight to ten hours before his body was discovered. Anne and Matthew left the house at 8.30 a.m. that day and returned around 4 p.m. So police thought Bill was likely killed shortly after Anne left the house. However, an autopsy placed Bill's time of death between 10 p.m. and midnight the night before. Noah was on a weekend excursion and Matthew was out that night with a friend, so Anne and Bill were alone until Matthew returned around midnight. Anne told police she made Bill dinner that night, they had sex, and then went to sleep. She claimed Bill was asleep in bed when she and Matthew left the next morning. Ten days before his death, Bill reported that his gun, holster, and some ammunition had all gone missing. While searching the house, investigators found the gun holster in a laundry hamper under some wet clothes. The gun, which turned out to be the murder weapon, was found in the garage inside the saddlebag of Bill's motorcycle. Ammunition was found on top of a safe, and three rounds were missing. One was in the chamber of the gun. One killed Bill and another casing was found outside the house. Detectives noted that the house smelled of bleach, and in the laundry hamper, they found a latex glove, which tested positive for gunshot residue on the outside and Anne's DNA on the inside. There it is. But what would Anne's motive be? From the outside, Bill and Anne seemed happy. Turns out that in March 2005, Bill attended a wedding in Arkansas where he met up with a former girlfriend named Barbara Miller. Bill and Barbara dated just after high school and even lived together for six months. Until the wedding, they hadn't seen or spoken to each other since the early 70s. Barbara was divorced, and Bill told her he was unhappy at home and living in se a separate part of the house from Anne. So Bill told Barbara he wanted a divorce. I'm curious though, as to who invited Bill to that wedding, because the bride was Barbara's sister. So unless Bill happened to know the groom, was he invited in the hopes it would rekindle something? Like, is that important to the case? No, this is the stuff that eats my brain alive at night. It, I can't. This is just this. I'm going to think about this for a very long time. So Bill and Barbara have a brief affair. But when Anne learned about it a month later, Bill agreed to end things. Soon after, Bill's wife, his children and his friends all start getting harassing letters and emails that seem to come from Barbara. Some of the letters claimed Barbara was pregnant. Some of them were like really weird invitations to a barbecue that Bill and Barbara were supposedly hosting together. The harassment continued to the point where Bill even reported vandalism and hang-up phone calls. 
The police ruled out Barbara and believed that Bill's wife, Anne, was responsible. In Anne's car, police found two letters similar to the ones that had been sent by Barbara. One of the letters was sealed, and the paper inside only contained Anne's fingerprints. The envelope adhesive contained Anne's DNA. A handwriting expert also corroborated that the handwriting was in fact Anne's. Also, the source of the harassing emails was traced back to Anne's work computer. And some were even sent from the Stout's family computer at home. Mm. And the hang-up calls that Bill complained about were traced to a payphone at Anne's workplace. The idea that Anne wrote harassing letters and sent them to her own children pretending to be their father's mistress is a level that my brain cannot fully comprehend. Yeah. Anne also sent threatening letters to Barbara's boss, and Barbara had to threaten Anne with a restraining order. Anne was arrested a few days after Bill's murder and charged with deliberate homicide. But Anne claimed to be innocent. During her trial in June 2008, Anne took the stand in her own defense, saying, quote, My life was very happy with Bill. We had a good life together. We were making plans to possibly move to Big Fork, making plans for vacation, and building a new house. And while I'm clearly not a detective, I find it amazing that Anne would claim to be innocent. Of all the evidence that the police found, She was alone with the victim at the time of his death. They found a glove with her DNA on the inside and gun residue on the outside. And while this statement is going to prove how broken my brain is, and I want to say in advance that I am not being glib about a murder in any way, but sloppy. Again, I'm not making light of a murder by saying this, but why keep the incriminating glove? It's latex. Burn it. Why hide the gun in the house? Take it with you when you leave the house the next day and dump it in a random garbage can. Why send letters harassed, like harassing letters in your own handwriting? She obviously had multiple computers at her disposal. Type one out. I mean, even then, you could eventually probably figure out what printer it came from. But why send harassing emails from your work computer? I mean, you'll love this. You're you're asking that as a hypothetical, but psychologist hat is always on. It's either that she was having a severe mental health episode or she is an actual narcissist and believed that she was never going to get caught, was smarter than everybody, whatever. I tend, given this information... She had found her husband having an affair, et cetera. I tend to lean towards she was having some sort of prolonged, I'm not an expert, mania or other mental sure. health episode. Um, that's what it sounds like to me. Because, yeah, it's so sloppy. And and the other thing I just want to say really quickly is what lawyer let her take the stand given all that information? Oh, my God. I mean, I just kind of assumed that maybe she wanted to get caught. Because police also found a note in Anne's bedside table written in her own handwriting that explained word for word how to use a gun. And when police searched the Stout family's home computer, they found an extensive search history of ways to kill someone. Part of me thinks Anne was equally unhappy in the marriage, but when she learned about Barbara, she realized if they divorced, Bill had another relationship lined up ready to go. And the very, the very idea was probably enough that Anne decided she preferred Bill dead as opposed to divorced. Of course, that is just a speculation. Uh, but since Barbara Miller has passed away in December 2021 at the age of 64. But after a three-week trial, the jury deliberated for six hours and found Anne guilty of Bill's murder. She was later sentenced to life in prison. She will be eligible for parole in 2038. After her sentencing, Anne requested to see her children one last time, but the judge said, quote, your children will be deprived of your company. It's not because you've been convicted of the crime. It's because you committed the crime. And I can't imagine what those poor kids have gone through, the deaths of their older brother and their father, and then finding out that their mother was responsible for one of those deaths. 
Apparently, one of the sons still fully supports his mother, visits her in prison. At the trial, he asked the judge for leniency. Regardless, I hope those boys were surrounded with love and support. I really, truly do. Uh, and briefly, for Lauren's psychologist hat, Anne grew up in a household of seven, and her father ran out on the family when Anne was just four years old. Anne had her first child when she was 17 and married Bill when she was 22, and he was about 31. I don't know if any of those facts will help the hat or not. Oh, yeah. It all feeds it. There it is. Uh, so while I thought these three cases would be wildly different, there ended up being kind of some overlapping similarities, like police zeroing in on the wrong suspect and making mistakes in the investigation. But in all three, families were left without answers. Sadly, Brian Ryan's mother, Shirley, who the family say was never the same after Brian's death, passed away in October 2013 at the age of 70. Brian's father uh, passed in December 2021 at the age of 81. The idea of living through your child's murder and then not getting to see justice in your lifetime is heartbreaking, and my heart goes out to the Rhine, Nice, and Stout families. Depressing true crime listeners since October 2020. I'm Christy Oxbro. Depressing and delighting. It's the hey. double-edged D's. Hey. Um, well, listen, let's take one more quick break. Quick break. Hit there the cam is. one more time. Grab another drink. And we're going to be right back to wrap up the Brian Ryan episode of True Crime and Cocktails. Final clap on three. One, two, three. Welcome back to the Brian Ryan episode of True Crime and Cocktails. Uh, listen, I'm just going to go through my thoughts, you know, real quick here. I, okay. I know that you've commented on this, but I just have to say, this man was shot in the arm twice. Yep. There was two bullets lodged in a wall. Mm -hmm. And the coroner who came to the site, to the scene, the detectives, everyone who was there went, nope, this was self-inflicted. Like, like, this is what I don't understand because this entire case has fallen apart because they could not determine the time of death because his body was treated as though it the cause of death was a suicide Correct. and so was not handled in the way that it should have for a homicide. That's that literally the fact that they can't figure out the time of death is, like you said, the crux of the problem with the case. Yes. Yep. I do not understand how anyone could go, where did the first two bullet shots come from? It's not typical that someone would shot them, shoot themselves in the yard once, somehow missing wherever they were attempting to shoot themselves. Yep. Do it again and then succeed? I've never heard of that. Have you? I mean, we've been doing this no. long enough. I have no, never heard of that in my not. life. It's It's, regardless of the other things that were then found, be all leading the story to homicide yeah just the bare bones the bare bones of it yeah how and this this brings me back to my soapbox that i have gotten on on this show many times which is can we treat every crime scene as though it's a homicide i beg yeah. because if it turns out that it was unfortunately self-inflicted at least you didn't taint evidence taint a crime scene mess up the case to a point that it will never be able to be solved. Oh, that's where I want my tax dollars going. That's yep. and listen, honest to God, I'm not kidding. Like that's places we need to be funneling money is yep. letting every crime scene be treated as though it was a homicide. I beg you, I beg you, if it ever, God forbid, happened to someone that you loved, I promise you that's what you would want for you and your family and loved ones. Oh, a hundred percent. What really gets me is the only reason they were like oh it's suicide was because of that it was mentioned in that 911 call which to Richards for in his defense he would have you know probably knocked on the door didn't get an answer opened it sees a body sees blood everywhere his face is bloody and beaten up I bet he looked for like half a second and was like, oh my God, out. And was like, oh my God, he killed himself. Well, and again, so let I this also it. be a lesson of 
we can't be just trusting the diagnosis of a random person who found a body. It's a trauma. Yeah. It, yes. The person is, is as far, I don't know what his occupation was off the top of my head. If you mentioned it, I don't remember. No. Um, don't believe he was trained no. to even be able to comment on such a thing. Sure. So yeah. why is that being used as this pinnacle piece of evidence? Like, that's so bizarre to me. Oh, it's insane. And again, like, I'm not blaming him in any way for saying no. I could see how he could feel that way. Of course. I'm blaming the police who told the family that's what it was and who went into it and went, yeah, this is what it is. Yeah. When they saw bullet wounds in the arm, they should have gone, wait a minute. Bullets in the wall two shots in the arm, full stop. That I will never get over. That is one of these ones that is confounding me like none other. That is cuckoo bananas. Yep. Um, and again, this is the thing that I keep, I keep writing down again and again in all of these notes is to your, to the point you made, there's one guy that we know who's a potential suspect who's got an alibi for one night and not the other and another it's flipped. And, and again, the, the, crux of this whole case yeah. is the science is the autopsy is again treating that body as though it was a homicide because it ended up being one would have changed the case there could have been justice for brian and his family had that been done and it just infuriates me yeah. um look and again i know i already you know piped in with this during the episode but tom sir if you didn't do it man you made yourself really look like you did. Oh, 100%. Um, I wrote down again, why didn't the bullets in the wall count for anything? I mean, this is just written in my notes so many times. I wonder how Marlene, Brian's employee, feels about giving out that information. Doesn't that seem a little odd? And I'm not blaming Marlene for the death, and I'm not saying she was involved. But, sure. it, you know, Brian calls, I'm coming back early. And then a stranger calls, is Brian there? Oh, he's coming back from his trip early. Like, why give that level of information? I just kind of assumed she assumed it was like a client in their small town. Fair. I guess to but. me, it's like you just say, no, he's not. He, he's not available right now. Can I take a message? This is more about a street proofing sure. thing moving forward. Let us learn from this that let's not be giving out information to strangers about anybody. Sure. That we don't know. Um, now, here's something I wanted to say. The footprints found outside Brian's home. Yeah. And the cop that said, well, the prints of those boots matched a pair inside Brian's home. Yep. How far did you take that? Because if we know that his door was always open and that the, the murder weapon potentially was taken from within his home ahead of time, why couldn't that person have also put on some of Brian's shoes and walked around in those and sure. then put them back in the house before leaving out another door? Who knows? To me, I was like, there is absolutely nothing about that chain of events that is proof to me that that this was Brian taking his own life because they were his own shoes. Right. It's just such an easy way to cover your own tracks, don't pardon the pun, at a crime scene. Sure. And if yeah. we know that someone was potentially in the house already stealing the gun, to me it's like, well... That, that all of that is kind of a red herring because someone sure. else could have put those shoes on, et cetera. Sure. I mean, it's also, I mean, they found that gun case so far from the house, which they didn't do a search around the perimeter of the house until the sister mentioned there was a gun case. Otherwise, were they not going to do a search at all? But either way... So yeah, they found the gun case and they were like, oh, OK, well, obviously someone left it there and then went to the house. And it's like, or what if they shot him? And the gun case was like in their pocket. And as they were leaving. They went that way and they were they got to that point and they were like, oh, who needs this? They also could have walked part way out of the house and went, oh, I don't need this and chucked the thing. Yeah. The fact that. There was eggs found in his stomach to me proves nothing about time of death because yep, people eat breakfast for dinner. People eat eggs at any time. And to me, if you've come home from a trip on the Friday and you come in your house and you're hungry, what do people tend to have like 
there's nothing to me that's like, well, it was eggs, so therefore it was breakfast, which means he died the next Correct. day. Oh, I agree. Again, there's we're following the science. There's none of it there. Uh, no proof. Um, yeah, I I feel like it could have gone either way. Now, my question is, Jody's sister Jennifer was she ever asked about her alibi? Because she seemed real fired up she about did. Tom. Yeah. Not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Mm. Because it's interesting that Jody had to account for where she was and give samples and whatever. But I'm curious yep. if Jennifer did because, again, Jennifer really was providing a lot of information about what a bad guy Brian was, which feels like motive to me. Sure. More so than like Larry, whose motive was kind of murky and could have been that we had some mental health issues happening. But there, you know, again, to me, Jennifer has a clear motive when she's also angry at the time. Yeah. Um, I think again, it's it's all very interesting. The fact that one of Anne's hairs was found by his left hand. I mean, she potentially could have known where the gun is. Where would Tom? Let's you know where would Tom know where Brian kept his gun in the house? I mean, and I tech probably would because they were sure. dating. Yeah. Also, maybe not. But you know what I'm saying? Like, that feels, I don't know. Again, if only we knew the time of death. Um. Now, these two other cases that you added, I have to say this. The true, and I won't get back on my soapbox about the judicial system, but mm -hmm. because it failed Barry Beach, in my opinion. Um, 100%. But there's two things that this made me think, because we hear so often about how coerced confessions can happen. And I wrote down two things. One, always lawyer up. Always lawyer up. Doesn't matter if you're innocent. Listeners, hear my words. Always lawyer up. They want to talk to you. I, I want a lawyer. They keep asking you. I want a lawyer. You're a broken record. Yeah. Number one. Number two, never talk. Never say anything. Do not say a word. Don't do it. You let them have their way in. They're masterful. They're trained. You let them have a little way in. No, it's too scary. And again, the system exists for a reason. It is not admitting guilt if you ask for a lawyer and you shut down. It is not admitting guilt. And a lawyer can try and claim that in court about you. Whatever doesn't matter. I would rather... For anybody, they have that scenario if they're being commit, charged with a crime they didn't commit. Um, then the opposite, which is a coerced confession, which is a lot harder to come back from. Yes. That's not me shaming Barry in any way. I'm saying, once again, it's a tragedy and maybe it can be a learning moment because it's terrifying to me. Um, 30 years in prison for something that you may, again, that was not proved, was not proved beyond a reasonable doubt. Oh, yeah. Blah, 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 blah. yeah, no thanks. Um, now Bill Stout, this is also interesting. She was so specific about the night before she said she made him dinner. They had sex and he went to bed. My question of course was, was a tox screen done in the autopsy? Was he drugged at all in that dinner that then made it easier for a Great shooting question. to happen? Could be that he was just a deep sleeper asleep. And that's why it was able to have hap to happen that way. But that sure. would be something that I, again, would obviously be interested in. Um, here's the other thing I wanted to say, because Bill meeting up with his ex, Barbara, at Barbara's sister's wedding. You're right. It does seem a little bit odd. Why would he get that invite so many years later? Yep. And then I just wrote down, this is the time of the internet. This is the time of Facebook, right? What was the year? 2007? Sure. Yes. Uh, yes, I think I so. I want to say. Yes, 2007. Right. So so we're talking Facebook exists at this point. Yeah. MySpace existed at that point also. This is the time, this prime time, and it still happens now, but this is a prime time in history where people who had missed connections or whatever suddenly sure. were being given this platform where you could connect with anyone you've ever met, potentially, if you know their name and they have a Facebook profile. Yeah. So then my question was, did anyone... Uh, did anyone in law enforcement look to see what the messaging was between Bill and Barbara before that wedding? Because what it seems like to me was there could have been some correspondence. Hey, my sister's getting married. Hey, sis, can I invite Bill 
you remember Bill, sure. right? Like it just felt like that adds context because I know that it's enough that he carried on an affair with her for some amount of time. But I do think that it's also just for context could be important to keep up how much of, of this affair was premeditated. How, how many times was there, you know what I mean? In terms of what the betrayal yeah. level was for his wife. Yeah. And then I just wrote down what lawyer let her take the stand. How could she take the stand? It's oh, a terrible I idea. I mean, it, it really yeah. is. And again, that's to protect, that would have been to protect her, um, which I'm sure she didn't see at the time. Then I wrote down the following psychologist hat on, and I thank you for giving some of her childhood history because, of course, it feeds into all of this. Yes. Uh, that, obviously, being one of seven, father leaving, um, that would be especially traumatic, I'm sure. If nothing sure. else, it would potentially begin an abandonment wound, which then... An affair would make worse. Well, and let's take one step for, before the, the affair, the suicide of her son that's an acute trauma oh 100%. and while i want to make it clear i never am in any way suggest i have my heart anyone who feels that that is their only way of handling their life i have nothing but compassion for this is not a judgment but i'm saying in terms of trying to get to Anne's mental state at the time sure someone who has an abandonment mood from childhood has a child unfortunately tragically take their own life that could re-trigger that abandonment wound. And right. that kind of acute trauma, especially also being given that it was her own child, et cetera. Then after that, the affair happens. The affair being, of course, another abandonment, another all of those kinds of themes. I can see there is some, some dots that we can connect to see how this woman not only... And this isn't me saying that everyone who has trauma is committing murders. Of course not. But I'm saying that I can see how there is a path to that. And especially sure. given her behavior in writing the letters, pretending to be Barbara to her own family. Like it, it does feel to me because, again, when we were talking in the moment, I was like, it's either like an acute mental health episode or it's narcissism. I believe now with all the context, it's it's an acute mental health issue. Very sadly it, to me. Sure. Um, it's the only thing that kind of makes sense there, uh, very tragically. And to your point, the bigger point of all is what a terrible, terrible tragedy for this entire family, for the remaining siblings, for all of the above. My goodness, that is just way too much. Way too Great. much. Yeah. Did you have any other uh, final thoughts? Um, no, I just, um, uh, nothing that I really, uh, I hadn't said already it's just god it's just one one sadness after the other yeah. um i will never get over hearing that police cleaned a crime scene i understand the idea of cleaning it before a family sees it mm -hmm. but just cleaning it up and being like well it, like, and how was that body handled when they were cleaning it up? How, like. Well, and the other thing too, to remember is, I don't know that I can speak for his family, but I think I can, because I think I could speak for almost any family when I say, if your loved one has passed and there is any inkling that it could be a homicide, I'm certain that they will stay out of that crime scene for as long as you tell them to, so that you can do your job and collect the evidence in a way that is following protocol yes. but because they didn't you know what i'm saying so it's like this concept of like we have to clean for the family yeah but again i think those family members would all rather not be able to get in there for a few more days to ensure that it was handled properly than to make sure yeah. you're cleaning it immediately that's just no it's bizarre oh a hundred percent i also like I'll, I'll never let it go that that's something that they did and the fact that it was you know what the guy in charge is going to dispose of it. Don't worry. I know. It's really like, bizarre. I don't. Sir. Sir. No. Don't literally take your work home with you. Like, I just. It baffles I... me. Maybe it's a case of their department didn't get a lot of homicides. But 
I think it's got to be because There's I was going to say, so what's the what's oh. the protocol for that? I, I believe the protocol in general is what you got to eventually, which is that you they typically hire a service. Not to be super morbid, but I there is a tick, couple TikTok accounts where it is people who do that for a living. They clean sure. crime scenes for a living and they will take you through uh, in videos. I haven't sat through. I think I watched one part of one because I was like, what's this? And then I was like, nope. I, I mean, I'm sure it came up in my, my algorithm because we have the podcast. Um, of course. But yeah, those, those systems and those services exist for a reason because I understand being compelled in the moment. If there was no protocol, sure. what do we do? Let's clean it. I guess I'll take this home. Like I, I get that, but, but again, there's so many conflicts of interest that I don't think I need to explain with that behavior that, yeah, I, I don't oh, know. Yeah. There's just so much. I mean, Hey, there is uh there was that movie, um, Amy Adams mm -hmm. and somebody else, uh, Emily Blunt, I want to say maybe Oh, about sisters who started doing crime scene cleanup oh. for money or something. I think they were maids and then they were like, we need more money. And they, they got into that or whatever. It was from years ago. I, so I'm not, I might be misremembering it, but so I knew there was some sort of service that could do it. Yeah. But I just, again, it was them going in and being like, well, we haven't even seen the crime scene yet, but we're just going with what we've told from a civilian. I can't belabor it, but also I, I mean, I just don't, I don't know what to say anymore. <laughs> it's yeah. like, Okay, great, but but what about his arm and the bullets in the wall, which you would have determined I imminently? Yep. Even if you as the detectives or the police officers on site didn't, when the coroner's yep. there and they find that, that's when you go, flag on the play. This is not what the person who called the 911 said it was. Yes. I also want to know, did the officers speak with Marlene at all? Because on the 911 call, she said... Um, suicide but when she went and saw the body herself she walked in and said this isn't like she walked in she saw it and went this is not absolute this is not suicide at all so if a civilian mm. could do that well and also of course then i go well then the gentleman that originally found the body her husband right yes um of course, then where does my true crime brain go? Well, could he have done it? And he called and said it was suicide to make it look like he was innocent. But then to that, I say, it doesn't matter because there was no time of death window that was able to be calculated. Right. So I could speculate that, but it's again, it's maddening because it's we could speculate a million different theories the yeah. one piece of evidence, the one piece of science that's, that's so heavily relied upon in homicide cases wasn't there. So, again, we can speculate till we're blue in the face. It doesn't change the fact that, to your point, it'll probably never be so solved because of that. And that is, again, a true tragedy. Yeah. Oh, I agree. Christy Oxborough, amazing work as always. I love that when you're like, well, that wasn't long enough. She's such a giver, folks, that then she puts in two more cases because that's how much she loves yous. Um, so we oh. thank you for your work as always. I've never ceased to be impressed. Oh, I mean, you're just giving the childhood me all the things I needed to hear. There's a method to my madness. I and we thank you, dear listeners, for you joining us on this journey. If you haven't already, give us a follow on the socials on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at True Crime and Cocktails, on Twitter at Not Detectives. If you'd like a little bit more bonus content, head over to patreon.com slash True Crime and Cocktails and check out our subscription-based service over there. And the only place for official True Crime and Cocktails merch is, of course, truecrewmerch.com. So check that out if you're interested as well. Christy, do you want to tell the people about next week's episode? On the next True Crime and Cocktails, Pauline Parker and Juliet Hume. I look forward to learning all about that in a mere week from now. Christy, do you want to tell the people? Uh, that's not it. You already did. Do you want to say good night to the people? Good night, Roman Reigns. Good night, China.